Good day and welcome to everyone across the world to the Second World Census Congress. And we are now starting session 13, looking at challenges of maternal and neonatal sepsis. <clears throat> we have some 16,000 people registered for the meeting across the world from more than 50 countries. So while I'm sitting in the afternoon of Cape Town, good morning, good afternoon, and good night to people across the world. We have a number of speakers today, and our first speaker is going to be Dr. Mercedes Bonnet from the World Health Organization in Switzerland. She's a perinatal health epidemiologist based in the Department of Reproductive Health and Research at the WHO in Geneva, um, and she's currently leading a global study to assess the burden and management of potential severe maternal infections and sepsis in healthcare facilities. So a very warm welcome to Mercedes, and she's going to be talking to us about the global burden of maternal and neonatal sepsis. Over to you, Mercedes. Good day, everybody. So uh, I will be talking about the burden of maternal infections and sepsis, infection-related uh, stillbirth, and mainly early neonatal infections. And uh, as you may know, uh, maternal infections refer to infections occurring in pregnancy or recently pregnant women after childbirth or abortion. And according to the last estimate, that we have 4% of women will develop an infection during the first six weeks after birth. This represents about 5.7 million women each year. This is about 15,000 a day. And by the end of this session, 500 women will have developed an infection after giving birth. Of course, there are huge differences across regions with higher proportions occurring in low middle income countries, up to 7% of postpartum um, infections versus 2% or less in high income countries. But remember, this is only for puerperal infections, as we don't have a global estimate for other maternal infections that may end up uh, causing sepsis. However, what uh, we have is some data regarding the burden of uh, disinfections in maternal ICU admissions. And data from a systematic review published in 2015 shows that about two to 700 women per 100,000 uh, deliveries will require ICU admission, with the vast majority of those occurring during labor or in the first 24 hours after delivery. This review also shows that genital tract infections uh, are uh, one of the main causes of admission to ICU among uh, obstetric patients, but also provides some data of non-obstetric causes of ICU admission and shows that the most important cause of non-obstetric admissions are community-acquired infections, and those represent uh, depending on the settings, between 13 to 27 percent of maternal ICU admissions uh, in different countries. And if we look closer to uh, the most common infections leading to ICU admissions, uh, we can expect, of course, that chorioamnionitis and endometritis uh, are one of the causes. Also, those infections that tend to be more severe during pregnancy, such as urinary tract infections or uh, some viruses like uh, flu, and also infections unrelated to pregnancy, such as uh, HIV and uh, community-acquired uh, pneumonia. And um, if obstetric patients form a relatively small proportion of ICU patients, you'll know that management of critically ill obstetric patients in the ICU or outside the ICU is a challenge, not only because they have an altered physiology, they also have different normal ranges for lab or clinical parameters, but also management of a pregnant, recently pregnant woman with infection is a challenge. And this is probably one of the causes uh, why maternal mortality due to infection is still very high. 
Uh, the last maternal mortality estimate that we have from 2015 showed that 11% of women die from what is called as maternal sepsis. That only includes infections from the genital urinary tract, uh, including puerperal infections, surgical site infections, for example, after C-section, and breast infections. However, we know that the burden of infections in maternal mortality is higher. On one side, a lot of women who die after an abortion, for example, do so uh, because of septic abortion. Uh, women who die from pneumonia, for example, are classified as an indirect uh, cause of maternal mortality. On the other hand, we also know that infections are an important contributing cause of maternal mortality and that around 25 to 40 percent, depending on the sources of women dying from other causes, will have an underlying infection that will contribute to the death. That is, for example, a woman dying from postpartum hemorrhage but who may have developed an infection during management in the hospital. And uh, as you can expect, maternal death, uh, the burden of maternal death across the different regions is uh, different, with the highest burden in Asia and Africa, 10 to 12 percent of the maternal death are due to a genital tract infection, and lower rates in Latin America or high-income countries. What is interesting is that uh, there has been also an increase in maternal death related to infection in high-income countries over the last uh, 20 years. And this infection, maternal infection has also consequences to the babies. And uh, out of the 3.2 million stillbirths, so that babies born with no sign of life, around half of them are caused by an infection in low middle income countries and approximately 10 to 25 percent in high income countries. Uh, these uh, stillbirths are mainly caused by infections like malaria, viruses, or genital tract infections during pregnancy. And as you know, these infections may also cause maternal sepsis. Moving to uh, live birth, neonatal infections cause a significant proportion of death in the first week of life, and these are mainly associated with maternal infection and colonization. Uh, this is a review from Chan published in 2013, where authors show that regardless of the methods that uh, people use to define maternal infection, lab confirm or clinical, a confirmation of, of infection, babies born to infected mothers are at higher risk of developing infections. And uh, the review also showed that babies born to mothers with risk factors for infection, such as pre-labor rupture of membrane or prolonged rupture from membrane, are also at higher risk of developing infections in the first week after birth. And this, of course, translates in huge numbers of ba or babies developing uh, infections. And uh, here I show uh, estimates of possible severe bacterial infections in neonates uh, at the global level, uh, with uh, an estimate 6.9 million cases uh, among live births more than 32 weeks of gestation or more than 1,500 grams at birth. This translated an incident risk of about 8% and a case fatality rate that goes up to 10%. Uh, this uh, translated infections representing one of the main causes of newborn mortality. If we look at sepsis, it's around 14% for uh, neonates and around 6% if we look at causes of death for children under five years. But if we sum up uh, neonatal sepsis, pneumonia, tetanus, and diarrhea, so all the other infections, those numbers are higher. So after seeing all these numbers, you know that infections are still one of the main causes of death for mothers and babies. But we have also uh, other challenges. 
uh, sepsis among pregnant, recently pregnant women and babies is very difficult to recognize and uh, to treat. We also have wide variations in definitions, so it's difficult to have comparisons uh, across countries or settings with no consensus definitions, in particular for small six neonates, and a new WHO consensus definition of maternal sepsis that we published in 2017 and that we are at the moment uh, validating. And this uh, maternal uh, sepsis, stillbirth, and early neonatal sepsis expose a broader health determinants and other underlying issues that basically relate to substandard quality of care in health facilities, uh, such as limited access to water and sanitation in health facilities, also constraints to access skilled birth attendants, lack or inconsistent use of some uh, infection prevention and control measures, such as the use of prophylactic antibiotics, inaccurate delayed diagnosis and poor management, and also delayed care seeking, uh, especially postpartum women and for newborns. So to address some of these gaps and challenges, we uh, implemented last year the Global Maternal Sepsis and a Study and Awareness Campaign to validate criteria for identification of maternal sepsis and possible severe maternal infections uh, to women who may benefit to uh, sepsis bundle management. We are also aiming to, to we also aim to assess the burden and the current management of maternal sepsis uh, around the world and contribute to rising awareness. So we um, implemented the study in 53 countries and recruited during one week over 300 thousand women in 600 facilities. We started with implementation of awareness campaign and that campaign started with World Sepsis Congress Spotlight last year, uh, organized in collaboration with the Global Sepsis Alliance and all the presentations that were focusing on maternal unit sepsis are available on their website. We developed uh, uh, printed materials that were displayed in the facilities participating in the study. And we also have a dedicated website where you can find more information about the study, the campaign, and uh, by end of the year, results of the study. I will end uh, acknowledging uh, the funders of the study and the campaign, and thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much for that wonderful presentation of some very challenging data across the world. Um, you've highlighted um, the fact that much of the sepsis is related to poor hygiene um, in healthcare facilities. Are there particular issues that you think need to be addressed in, in these areas that will, would make a substantial difference to this very high incidence of sepsis? I think that uh, regarding maternal and neonatal sepsis, uh, awareness and early identification of sepsis is uh, very important and prone management. What we know is that uh, often uh, even antibiotics are delayed, so women and babies are not receiving uh, optimal care, even when they are uh, already uh, at the health facilities. Okay. So to people across the world, there is an opportunity to ask questions um, to Dr. Bonet, and please send those in on the chat. Um, in the meantime, um, Ms. Hines, you raised the question of early recognition. Are there any differences in early recognition of sepsis um, in, in women around the period of delivery? Um, it is challenging. It is challenging, uh, especially um, during labor or uh, immediately after birth, right? Because of uh, yeah. physiological changes and 
And also because uh, I sometimes people uh, don't think about infections. There are other complications that women could have uh, that uh, may make people not think that uh, the what uh, the woman is presenting could be related uh, to an infection. Okay. Yeah. I have a question from from one of the listeners um, saying thank you for your talk. And did your study identify screening criteria for maternal and neonatal sectors in low and middle income countries? That's related to what I was asking just now. Yeah. Uh, so the, there are different um, scores and systems that have been uh, developed. Uh, other signs uh, to uh, try to um, better or sooner identify women that uh, may be at risk of developing complications. Uh, there are very few that are specific for infections. Uh, as we can expect, w women may have other complications, right? Uh, in our study, we collected data that, uh, and now we are looking at the data uh, to see if those, the existing ones, uh, are uh, um, useful in low middle income countries. Uh, especially because some of them use some uh, lab results uh, or need technologies that are not available in those settings. Okay, and I think the final question that I have here, which is again related, is someone asking, are we any closer to a national or international maternal early warning system um, in the perinatal period? Well, that's one of the objectives of the study that, that we conducted and is uh, what we have been trying, uh, we are trying uh, now to see if uh, with the clinical uh, and uh, lab information that we were able to collect and that was what was available from medical records of those women, we can, uh, uh, let's say, test those scores and system and came out with something that could be used uh, in low resource settings. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, that's been a wonderful presentation and we're now going to have to move on to our next speaker. So thank you very much, Mercedes. Our next speaker is um, Dr. Zofi Butta, um, who comes from um, a family of physicians and educations in Peshawar. Um, Dr. Butta currently holds several national and international society responsibilities and has a very active interest in international child health. He's going to be coming to us now speaking about prevention of neonatal sepsis. Just to warn the listeners, this is a pre-recorded talk because unfortunately he's not available, which means that we won't be able to ask him questions at the end. So over to Dr. Butta. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to speak to you today virtually on preventive strategies for newborn sepsis, particularly in the context of global health. And I'm going to focus in the main on why is this important. This is important because if you look at the contribution of neonatal mortality to under five deaths, these themselves contribute to almost half of all under five mortality as we speak. And much of these newborn deaths in various geographies are related to three major categories of disorders, intrapartum events or asphyxia, prematurity and its related complications, and disorders which can be categorized as serious infections, including sepsis. We know that prematurity is not only a direct contributor to neonatal mortality, but in terms of indirect contribution, prematurity associated with growth retardation is, underlies almost half of all neonatal deaths in various geographies, including Africa and, and Asia. Neonatal sepsis, which is the extreme spectrum of neonatal infections, is a disorder associated with case fatality rates upwards of 30 to 40 percent in many areas. These are recent data from a study in India which had looked at 
cases of neonatal sepsis in hospitalized settings related to both etiological spectrum and, uh, and clinical diagnoses per se. And as you will see across various centers um, uh, noted here in this particular slide, case fatality rates associated with neonatal sepsis were around 40 to 50 percent. And that makes it imperative that not only do we have better strategies for managing neonatal sepsis, but we put a lot of attention on preventive strategies for avoiding this in the first place. That in turn necessitates a realization and recognition of major risk factors for neonatal sepsis, and they are many. And this is just a summary from our studies in Pakistan on looking at what were the major underlying factors for neonatal sepsis, which related to both the conditions in and around birth, uh, maternal infections, premature rupture of membranes, and also the overlap, as I've mentioned, with interpartum asphyxia and prematurity low birth weight. Importantly, lack of breastfeeding, as I will highlight in a second, was an important contributing factor in, in several cohorts. In a landmark study in Ghana by uh, Betty Kirkwood and her team, it was very clearly identified that the risk of neonatal mortality increased in several folds according to delay in the initiation of breastfeeding. And these are some of the evidence that are around the current global recommendation for initiation of breastfeeding very early on, which makes a lot of physiological sense in terms of prevention of neonatal sepsis through the passage of colostrum and essential maternal neonatal access protection very early. Obviously, these studies have uh, controlled for residual compounding and reverse causality, and therefore the data around early initiation of breastfeeding and neonatal sepsis, as well as early infant infections and mortality are reasonably robust. Let's look at what are the preventive strategies that work. Clearly, one needs to have a conceptual framework that looks at interventions that reduce susceptibility, that also reduce exposure, and these can be both environmental factors that relate to poverty and living conditions and delivery conditions, but also very specific risks associated with practices in and around childbirth, such as hand hygiene, use of clean birth kits, nutrition, as I've mentioned, early initiation of breastfeeding, and also appropriate diagnosis and appropriate institution of therapy early on. There is also the important issue of delivery platforms that I do not have time to get into in my presentation today, but these are very important elements in scaling up of evidence-based interventions. The evidence around the use of clean birth kits and newborn and maternal infection-related outcomes is reasonably robust. When this was last evaluated in a systematic review, because clearly it is very difficult to randomize controlled trials for this evidence-based intervention today, uh, there were several studies that had looked at mortality reduction, reduction in omphalitis, the risk of neonatal infection, and of course, risk of neonatal uh, maternal uh, sepsis itself. When we looked at it ourselves in a, an interconnectedness of maternal and newborn health review, we found that both maternal and neonatal morbidities reduce quite significantly in, uh, through the use of clean birth kits to the, to the extent of closed round 70 to 80 percent reduction in neonatal and maternal morbidity. If you do have preterm premature rupture membranes, the global evidence around this in terms of treatment prophylactically with antibiotics is very strong. It reduces the risk of birth uh, within 48 hours and seven days uh, by about 19 percent or so. It also reduces maternal infections, such as chorioamnionitis, and significant reductions have been reported in several studies for neonatal morbidity rates like pneumonia. One important limitation in many of these studies are limited uh, diagnostics in terms of culture positivity rates. But as things stand, this is a very important intervention for prevention of neonatal sepsis early on in this particular condition. If you look at the composite review that we did of uh, the impact of antibiotic treatment for maternal and neonatal outcomes, you find that both for maternal chorium amnionitis and neonatal infections, including pneumonia, the impact rates were quite significant. And overall, the burden of these complications reduced by about 29, 30 percent. 
A very important contribution to neonatal adverse outcomes in recent years is the recognition that cord infections are an important contributory factor. Now, this particular audience may be well aware of the risk of neonatal tetanus with exposure and contamination of the cord at the time of delivery or soon afterwards. The corresponding relationship of neonatal sepsis to ampullitis is less evident. But we do know that these are very common. They are associated in some settings with close to around 15 to 20 percent uh, incidence rate. And it can be associated with rapid progress to sepsis and case fatality rates approaching 40 percent. We were able to evaluate the potential of strat preventive strategies like the application of chlor cord chlorhexidine in rural Pakistan in a major evaluation where we provided or chlorhexidine for application to the birth attendant and the family for use after birth. And it was a very simple study looking at the application of 4% chlorhexidine to the cord using simple uh, materials that were provided and bundled with clean delivery kits. The impact on omphalitis rates in the chlorhexidine application group compared to controls was quite significant. And as you can see, not only did omphalitis rates go down in this large cluster randomized trial in rural Pakistan, but also neonatal mortality rates reduced 40%. And this was not just evident in the Pakistan study. When we look at overall the evidence from other studies in the region, notably in Nepal, in Bangladesh, and in Pakistan, overall the use of any chlorhexidine application after birth in South Asia was associated with the reduction in all-cause neonatal mortality by 23%. Subsequent studies have shown a lower impact because they have included also facility-based births where clearly the risk of infection is not as high, but the global evidence around the impact of neonatal uh, sepsis reduction from cord chlorhexidine application is strong. These are data from a pooled analysis from the three trials that I've mentioned, and it doesn't take uh, um, my statistical analysis to see that the impact on any kind of neonatal mortality following a cord application of chlorhexidine is reasonably robust. Kangaroo mother care, which is an, an intervention which is rapidly gaining coverage and support worldwide, is associated with the reduction in the risk of both neonatal morbidity and importantly mortality, and an important contributor to reduction in morbidity and complications is also its benefits on breastfeeding. So if you look at kangaroo care versus conventional neonatal care, we find pretty robust impact through the application of kangaroo care. Obviously the evidence around intermittent kangaroo care is much stronger because of the large number of studies, but overall we see an almost 50% reduction in severe infection neonatal sepsis. So ladies and gentlemen, as I conclude, there is evidence from a lot of work on the preventive potential of many interventions for neonatal survival. These lead to interventions that are delivered in community settings, such as hard care, clean birth kits that I've mentioned, and they can be instituted both close to the time of birth and also uh, demand created for these interventions through antenatal care and pre pregnancy counseling. They also include interventions that can be done in facilities, first and second level facilities, and also in tertiary settings. If you look at the estimated impact of these interventions on infection-related newborn deaths, the impact of various interventions on neonatal infections is quite significant. This is from a recent modeling exercise in The Lancet, where we looked at both the impact of case management as well as other preventive strategies in the mothers for reduction in infection-related newborn deaths. Some of these interventions work through the pathway of reducing small dates births and others through case management. If you look at overall the contribution of preventive strategies to reduction in infection-related newborn deaths, those contributions from clean birth practices, clean postnatal practices, use of cord chlorhexidine, and breastfeeding are quite significant. And overall, almost half of all neonatal deaths can be prevented by use of preventive strategies as well. So let me finish by saying that this nexus between maternal care and newborn health in the context of neonatal infections is strong. And because it's strong, it requires an institution of a package of interventions, both from pre-pregnancy, pregnancy, childbirth, and beyond. And they need to reduction of, relate to reduction in maternal malnutrition, 
a rapid detection and treatment of infections in the mothers, um, prevention of complications after birth, and institution of appropriate early and exclusive breastfeeding, and also importantly, managing these through simplified antibiotic therapy and low cost use of strategies for prevention of infection in, in these settings. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much to um, Dr. Butter for that presentation. Unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, he's not available for any questions. But it is remarkable the impact of very simple interventions, none of which are that expensive. And as Dr. Butter has demonstrated, these implementation of these interventions could cause a massive reduction in the impact of sepsis on both mothers and children. We're going to move on now to our next presentation, and our next speaker is Dr. Daniela Souza, who's a pediatric intensivist in Sao Paulo, Brazil. She obtained her medical degree in, Sa in Brazil and then moved to Sao Paulo to do a fellowship both in pediatric and pediatric intensive care at the University of Sao Paulo. Her PhD thesis focused on the epidemiology of pediatric sepsis in Latin America, and she's continued that interest in sepsis in the critical care environment. So currently she works as a pediatric intensivist at the University of Sao Paulo and Hospital Serio Libanes in Sao Paulo. Um, she's now going to be speaking to us about sepsis in children in Latin America. Welcome to Daniela. Thank you, Andrew. It's a pleasure to be a speaker in the Second World Sepsis Congress. In the next few minutes, I will uh, present some aspects about Latin America, what we know about pediatric sepsis in the world and in Latin America, what is wrong, and some perspective for the future. Latin America is a sub-region of the Americas with different countries in many aspects, such as income distribution, access to health care, education, basic sanitation, and uh, the use of technology. Social economic inequality rise reduce uh, its potential for growth. Latin America is the region with the highest level of income inequality in the world. We observed great difference in social economic indicators among countries. Health inequality in Latin America remains a serious issue despite strong uh, economic growth and improved social indicators over the past decade. Uh, however, in this region, a minority of the population has access to the private health sector. The vast majority depends ex exclusively on public services, where deficient and short aid should be enormous. Despite this problem, we have observed great success in child mortality reduction between 1990 to 2005. In this period, the child mortality reduced about 16%. Despite this success, the progress in some countries remains insufficient to meet the Millennium Development Goal 4. About 20% of the countries in Latin America still have a child mortality above 25 deaths per 1,000 live births. Most of these deaths result from preventable infectious disease and sepsis. So we have a lot to do in this region. And what do you know about pediatric sepsis? Sepsis is a major childhood disease, both in terms of frequency and severity. And sepsis is one of the most important diseases in people. Studies in high-income countries have shown that the incidence of the disease in children has been increasing. Despite the global efforts to improve the diagnosis and the treatment of sepsis, sepsis-related mortality remains high. This problem is even more important in low- and middle-income countries, where low vaccine coverage rates 
and the poor sanitary conditions lead to a high frequency of infectious disease. Another fact, the cost of the disease is very high. In this way, sepsis is a growing public health problem. Despite the relevance of the disease, epidemiological data on sepsis in children are scarce. A major problem is that we get information from infectious diseases and we assume it as sepsis. And we really, we don't know the real burden of pediatric sepsis. And uh, in Latin America, what do you know about pediatric sepsis? We know very little about it. In this region, the studies in general are not representative do not encompass all regions and carried out in pickles. Uh, this study from Argentina showed an incidence of severe sepsis of 13 cases per 100 admitted children. Most children presented in septic shock and were from the community. In another study in Colombia, Jamarillo Bustamante identified around 1,000 cases of sepsis in the first 24 hours of uh, admission to 19 vehicles. Of these, 27% had sepsis, 25% had severe sepsis, and 48% had septic shock. Our group evaluated the prevalence of sepsis and admission to 21 pictures in South America. We observed that 43% of admitted children met sepsis criteria on the first day of EPICO admission. Of the 1,900 children included in, this, in the study, 26% met criteria for severe sepsis and 20% for septic shock on the first day of admission. When we compare public and private hospitals, we observed the prevalence of septic shock was higher in public uh, pictures. Children admitted to public hospitals had a higher number of organ dysfunctions at admission and more chronic disease. This available data regarding the prevalence of sepsis in children in Latin America suggests that sepsis is quite frequent in Latin America pickles. And about uh, pediatric sepsis mortality. Some high-income countries have been showing progress in pediatric sepsis prognosis. The mortality of sepsis in these countries declined in the last four decades, with some countries registering rates as low as 5%. However, Advances in the prognosis of children with sepsis observed in high-income countries have not yet been globalized, and mortality still remains quite high in some regions. In Latin America, the death of sepsis mortality is higher to those reported in some high-income countries. In Brazil, sepsis-related mortality is about 19%. In Colombia, 24% and in Argentina, about 34%. In South America, sepsis-related mortality is 20, uh, 20%. And again, when we compare public and private pickles, we observed that the sepsis-related mortality was higher in public pickles, as well as the proportion of deaths with the first 24 hours of admission. Uh, in the state from Colombia, about 50% of children were admitted in the late stage of septic shock, and more than 40% had modes on admission, which result in high mortality. Although neither the study from Colombia nor the study from South America allows conclusions regarding the factors associated with high septic mortality in these regions, the authors of both studies suggest that the children were admitted late in PICO, and it results to greater morbidity and mortality and high social and economic costs. And well, about the epidemiology of pediatric sepsis in Latin America, what can we suppose? In a recent systematic review, 
that included 15 studies from 12 countries, the authors observed an incidence of 48 cases of sepsis and 22 cases of severe sepsis per 100,000 persons years in children. The authors made an estimate of 1.1 million cases of sepsis in children per year. When we translated this data to Latin America, we suppose that, uh, that there is about 100,000 cases of pediatric sepsis per year in this region. Since most of the studies included in the systematic review were conducted in high-income countries, the authors believe that these data are underestimated. And what's wrong in pediatric sepsis in Latin America? Why does sepsis appear to be more frequent in Latin America? And uh, why is mortality is too high? First issue that needs to be addressed is the limited knowledge about pediatric sepsis by lay people and the health professionals. A survey conducted by Latin American Sepsis Institute in Brazil showed that only 14% of respondents had heard of the term sepsis, while in Germany, US, and Canada, more than 30% of the lay public has heard the term sepsis. Also in Brazil, a research demonstrated that the physicians have a limited knowledge of sepsis. A second uh, identifying issue relates to poor availability of resources, limited access to health services, and the poor availability of pediatric critical care beds. The third issue is associated with the limited training of pediatric intensivists in Latin America. The fellowship programs are centralized in urban areas, and the pediatric intensivists have reduced time for research. Most pickles are attended by pediatricians, not by pediatric intensivists. These studies showed that the availability of pediatric intensivists is variable across countries. Only uh, five six uh, percent of the pickles has a pediatric intensivist full time in pickle. Um, uh, this, this study conducted by Isla City demonstrated that in Latin America, the PICO mortality was inversely related to the availability of PICO, availability of the jet uh, intensity, and number of beds. Another question. We have uh, information about the jet sepsis in PICO. Uh, and the most information derives from studies with the small sample size conducted with heterogeneous populations, and you know these data were underestimated. There are these studies in emergency departments and wards. And what can we conclude about pediatric sepsis in Latin America? Uh, the debate about the incidence and mortality of pediatric sepsis in Latin America still remains. Data from the studies demonstrated that in Latin America, sepsis is a still frequent cause uh, of admission and death. Pediatric sepsis mortality re remains high in Latin America, and the greater mortality may be related to late admission in public hospitals. Uh, and uh, about the, the future, uh, it's very important to know the real burden of the genetic sepsis in Latin America. More studies are necessary to evaluate the causes of high prevalence and mortality and the role of education, distribution of health resources, and the access to healthy care. I believe that the problem of pediatric sepsis in Latin America is not the limitation of resources, but the lack of education and in, in relation to the disease. Now, we need to work for WH resolution to become a reality. Uh, Latin America Sepsis Institute start its working. During the Latin American Sepsis Institute meeting in Sao Paulo, Brazil, last May, 
delegates representing 16 Latin countries wrote the São Paulo Declaration and called for urgent action by improving the prevention, diagnosis, and the treatment of sepsis. And in the next year, Latin America Sepsis Institute will assess the prevalence of pediatric and the neonatal sepsis in PICO in Brazil. Thank you so much for your attention. Daniela, thank you very much for that wonderful presentation and for giving us this insight into the burden and the implications of pediatric sepsis in Latin America. Just one question from my perspective. Um, you've highlighted the lack of access to pediatric intensive care for severe sepsis. Do you have any ideas as to how emergency department access to treatment for children with sepsis could be improved, or do you think this would be a significant matter for you to look at? Oh, um, in Latin America, we don't have uh, studies of pediatric sepsis in emergency home. I think the problem is very, very important. After the, the spread the, the pediatric, uh, Latin American Sepsis Institute will uh, assess the, the prevalence and mortality of pediatric sepsis in emergency home too. It's uh, the next step. Okay. Well, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. And we're going to move on now to our next presentation by Professor Adrian Randolph, who's Professor of Anesthesia and Pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. And she's a senior associate in critical care medicine at the Boston Children's Hospital in Massachusetts. She's worked in the medical surgical pediatric ICU for over 20 years. And she's a founder and first chair of the Pediatric Acute Lung Injury and Sepsis Investigators Network. Um, Professor Randolph has published widely, and she's actually now going to be speaking to us about sepsis in pandemics and epidemics. So welcome, Adrian. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I have no relevant uh, disclosures um, for this presentation. But um, first, I wanted to make sure that everybody was clear on the terminology uh, that I was going to use. So I'm going to define epidemic and pandemic uh, for the audience. Um, first, an, an outbreak is a sharp uptick in cases of a disease. Many diseases exist in the population at low rates, but they may um, call them an outbreak when all of a sudden many more cases than expected are seen or many more deaths than expect are seen in severity. Um, a um, epidemic um, is declared when more cases of a disease occur than expected in a given area or among a specific group of people over a spe specified period of time. Now, um, the threshold depends on each pathogen. So as I said, some diseases exist in the population usually, um, but others you don't expect to see, and they, there may be a novel pathogen and an outbreak of a novel pathogen in a specific area. And uh, for an example is the Ebola epidemic in West Africa, which killed over 11,000 people between 2013 to 16, and the SARS outbreak of 2003, which killed 800 people. A pandemic, however, is when an epidemic spreads across several countries affecting a sizable, quote unquote, portion of the population in each. And usually to declare a pandemic requires the World Health Organization to come to agreement that this um, epidemic has spread broadly enough, affecting enough people that they declare a pandemic. Now, one pandemic that is, you know, was many ages, literally ages ago, um, is the um, plague, Black Death. That's one of the biggest examples of a widespread pandemic that killed a very, very large pop portion of the population. It's caused by gram-negative bacteria, the Yersinia pestis. There's three types, bubonic, pneumonic, and septicemic. So even in those early days, they used the septic uh, term. And pneumonic spreads the most rapidly um, through respiratory 
And if not treated with antibiotics, um, the plague causes respiratory failure and shock, multi-organ failure within two days of um, infection, then it's usually fatal. So when you talk about organ dysfunction and failure to death with an infection, it really meets all criteria for overwhelming sepsis. So if you change the terminology here, in, instead of saying all these people died of the plague, um, in 1350, the terminology could say 75 million people died of sepsis from Yersinia pestis infection. And in 1665, 100,000 people died in London from Yersinia pestis sepsis. Smallpox is another example. In the 20th century, 300 to 500 million deaths from smallpox. It's caused by a virus, variola major or variola minor. And there's four types, ordinary, modified, malignant, or hemorrhagic. If you look at these malignant and hemorrhagic subtypes, which are usually fatal, the malignant form usually have profound quote-unquote toxemia. The hemorrhagic form has coagulopathy. And both meet criteria for overwhelming sepsis. Going back to the 1918 influenza pandemic called the Spanish flu, where there's the um, very, very high death rate um, from the Spanish flu in this one year period, up to one in three people in the world were infected and 5% of the global population died. Reanalysis of autopsies in the influenza pandemic showed that many of these people died from bacterial superinfection with overwhelming sepsis. So many, you know, if not most of these people died of sepsis related to influenza um, with bacterial co-infection. Now, there have been many uh, influenza pandemics, um, and the 1918 was one of the most lethal with the Spanish flu, and our most recent is the 2009 influenza pandemic, where the last um, approximation was that about 284,000 people died. Um, and there have been numerous studies showing that, yes, bacterial co-infection was present in many of these patients who died, studies that my network has done and also um, other networks. But influenza alone can also cause a viral sepsis with lead leading to multi-organ failure from cytokine storm, and the patient can get overwhelmed with their host immune response to influenza. So, but mo most of these people are dying of multi-organ failure in deaths from influenza infection, and that ends up um, meeting criteria that they're dying of sepsis. So, just um, when Looking at some of these epidemics and um, pandemics, I'm quoting Robert Fowler here, um, who wrote a very important paper about the Ebola epidemic, really making the point that, you know, Ebola um, virus disease is sepsis. It's a severe febrile illness, profound gastrointestinal manifestations, leading to intravascular volume depletion, shock, and organ dysfunction. And if more of these patients had optimal sepsis care with basic monitoring and supportive treatment, just op optimal, just basic critical care um, support, many of these patients may have survived. So my overall main point of, of my talk is that we, when we talk about these epidemics and pandemics, we talk about oh, it's death from, you know, 2009 influenza infection, but many, many more people are infected um, than died. And those that did die really died mostly of sepsis. And what we need to do when we have epidemics and pandemics in the future is really implement our sepsis education and protocols um, and bundles during these pandemics to save the most lives so that people can really recognize the caregivers as well as the public can start to recognize the early signs of sepsis developing in the, um, these infected people and um, get optimized their treatment with fluid resuscitation and supportive care and appropriate antibiotics if there's bacterial co-infection 
um, to, um, and that will likely decrease some of the mortality that we see um, during epidemics and pandemics. So thank you very much, um, and I will take any questions. Well, thank you very much for that, Adrienne. It's sobering to hear just how many millions of people have died of sepsis throughout the years. Um, I'm inviting anyone with questions for Dr. Randolph to um, write those in, and we can give them to her. In the meantime, Adrienne, you've really highlighted the point that it's very basic intensive care would make a huge difference. Do you think you could highlight what sorts of, do we need ventilators? Is it much more simple care that you think could make such an impact on epidemic outcomes? Yes, I think that um, at least for, um, you know, some of these um, areas where critical care resources are limited, um, just you know, during the Ebola epidemic, um, Dr. Fowler pointed out that um, many of these patients didn't get IV fluids and just fluid resuscitation and just basic critical care. Um, you know, those patients uh, didn't necessarily need intubation, but they just needed, um, you know, more sepsis resuscitation fluid wise and, um, you know, some of those all as well could have had bacterial translocation from their inflamed um, gastrointestinal system and early recognition of that and treatment um, was essential. But in the, um, even in countries that have high levels of critical care resources, many patients during these pandemics um, of influenza are turned to, sent home from the emergency room not recognizing that this isn't just flu. This patient has a bacterial superinfection and needs antibiotics and then die of an overwhelming bacterial infection or not recognizing that this influenza infection has progressed to um, organ dysfunction. And, um, you know, this isn't a patient who just is, um, you know, looking, you know, like they feel lousy due to the flu this patient is, has um, really progressed to the point where we need to do some basic laboratory tests and the patient really needs to get admitted to the intensive care unit because they may have a hyperlactademia, um, be more hypoxic, um, have even progressed to having some renal dysfunction. Um, so, you know, people are, don't have sepsis in their mind, but the uh, usually with influenza infection and but it, um, on a positive note, the um, state health department in California this year um, with the H3N2 um, strain of flu outbreak with some increased severity um, had actually put out guidelines and recommendations to providers to recognize sepsis in the influenza patients. Because, um, you know, to really prevent death from flu means that you early have early recognition um, and to distinguish those patients who really have sepsis and need to be admitted to the hospital and get aggressive uh, supportive care. Okay, and that's fantastic. I have a question here from one of our listeners, and the question is, could you speak about successful, low-cost, effective point-of-care diagnostic tests or practices that could be used by minimally trained healthcare workers for sepsis recognition? That's quite a challenging question, but I don't know if you could address that for us. Yes, it is a um, it is a uh, challenging question um, because um, you know th there's. Um, People are working, however, people are working on it. And the tech, the promising thing is that that technology for some of these, um, um, you know, tests that um, can be bundled together is um, actually moving forward to the point where um, with small bits of blood, you might be able to run some basic uh, markers um, and the cost is going down to make it more feasible. For um, for being able to um, 
look, you know, to identify patients who uh, may have sepsis. Um, but I think that our our clinical um, assessment is still going to be the main thing, um, unfortunately, for many of these patients. And if patients have hypotension, especially patients with influenza um, and profound hypoxia, you know, they are um, probably progressing to, you know, much more severe disease. Um, and especially if, uh, you know, giving them a, um, you know, there it's not just dehydration and giving them a fluid bolus um, is not um, really resolving it, that you'll still have to go with some of your um, clinical signs. And maybe those patients may uh, have a bacterial superinfection and need antibiotics um, with high fever and just clinical signs. Um, because there is nothing that 100% for certain distinguishes these patients with um, influenza um, infection alone versus influenza with bacterial superinfection. However, those patients with bacterial superinfection are much more likely to have persistent um, shock. And so if you see a patient with that, I think you need to, um, you know, think that this is likely a bacterial superinfection. Well, thank you very much for that, Adrian, and thank you for that wonderful presentation. We're going to move on now to our next present, presenter, who is Dr. Jeffrey Smith, who's an obstetrician, gynecologist, and public health practitioner with some 25 years of clinic and clinical and public health experience in countries across Asia, Africa, and Latin America. He's worked on programs for maternal and child survival. Um, and he spent some 10 years in Asia leading maternal and reproductive health programs in places such as Nepal, Afghanistan, and Thailand. And Jeffrey is now going to be speaking to us about implementing programs to reduce maternal infection in resource-limited settings. So welcome, Jeffrey. We look forward to your presentation. Great. Thank you very much, Andrew. And thanks to everyone who has logged in. Um, this is my second year in presenting, and it's really an opportunity to help um, increase the discussion about sepsis and especially bring some uh, light to the issue of maternal and early newborn infection, which re maternal sepsis is the leading cause of maternal mortality. But what are the, the actions and the programs that we can take in order to address this high cause of maternal and newborn mortality? And what are some of the steps um, that have proven to be effective? <clears throat> so I'd like to first uh, review in this presentation a few different things. Why are infection rates for mothers and early newborns high? What are some of the barriers to addressing <clears throat> Uh, maternal and early newborn infections in low and middle income countries? And what are the quality improvement approaches that can be used? Um, it's interesting to note that today is not only the anniversary, the 40th anniversary of the Alma Atta Declaration for Primary Health Care, but today here in Washington, D.C., is the launch of the Lancet Global Report on High Quality Health Systems for the Sustainable Development Goals era. And so people are really looking at a systems approach to quality and a systems approach to quality uh, improvement across multiple different domains. So what can we do and what remains to be done? Um, I think in looking at the strategies that have been employed in recent years to address maternal and early newborn mortality, some of those very things about that strategy may be uh, resulting in increased maternal infection rates. The, the, great, the, the success of the strategy to promote facility-based births has resulted in more women going to facilities for delivery. However, those facilities have not been equally upgraded. The quality of care and indeed the quality of the infrastructure and the workforce have not kept pace with that effort to increase facility birth rates. Many facilities continue to have poor infection prevention practices. Uh, labor management continues to be challenging. 
uh, and prolonged labor and prolonged rupture of membranes remained remain central to the pathway towards maternal infection rates and, and early newborn infection. Indeed, uh, the increase in facility birth rates has also resulted in increased cesarean section rates, which dramatically increase a woman's up, uh, risk of developing an infection. And the infrastructure uh, results in limitations on infrastructure result in crowding in facilities um, at, with often two women or three women to a bed. Um, and this results in women themselves saying, I've come here for the birth, but there's simply no place for me to stay. And so women themselves uh, and their families result in leaving the facility early. And we know that uh, the signs and symptoms of uh, postpartum infection really occur in the 48 to 72 hours after delivery when women are already at home. So the success of our own strategies are putting us at a, in a situation where um, we have I increased facility infection rates. But what are some of the final, uh, some of the other factors that uh, affect this? And we held a consultation uh, at Japigo in uh, our headquarters office near Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore a few years ago, and we we grouped those factors that result in maternal infection into three different areas. Um, delivery factors, some of the things that I mentioned, uh, early discharge, poor infrastructure, examination, etc. Some environmental factors or, or predisposing factors, which are long distance from health facilities and poor economic, socioeconomic status and poor transport. Um, but then also many factors related to the mother and the, the mother's health coming into pregnancy, such as anemia, obesity, poor nutrition, um, the, the risk of co-infection or, or other infections that increase her vulnerability, such as HIV or malaria. So there are multiple different factors that increase the, the possibility of developing an infection. So when we look at programs that are meant to address the causes of infection, we need to think about designing programs and improving quality by using a context-driven, customized approach to improving quality of care. Some of the discussion here today in Washington at the release of the Lancet Commission report on high-quality health system really have focused on some of these things at both the micro level, at facility level, as well as at the macro level, at, at government and health system level, looking at the importance of governance for quality, looking at redesign of service delivery systems, uh, improving and transforming the health workforce, and igniting demand for quality among, uh, among people, among those who the health system is meant to serve. So what do I mean by these different approaches to quality, such as standardization, optimization, and transformation? When we look at uh, the specific issue of quality in a facility, it may be something that's related to poor adherence to standards. It may be something related to organization of services and poor organization resulting in inability to initiate good quality care in a timely manner, or it could be some, something more radical, the fact that the health system doesn't allow for women to get the, the care that they need in a timely manner, and therefore some transformative approaches are, are necessary. Um, in terms of standardization, it's, this is often a first step in ensuring improved quality of care and leading to lower infection rates, ensuring that, uh, the, that antibiotics are given prior to any cesarean section, ensuring that the, clean, the environment is clean and infection prevention practices are being upheld. But, when, but in some situations, it's not really an issue of standardization of care. It's the process of care. So looking at how care systems can be reorganized in order to ensure that providers are available when they need to be, to be sure that women are, are able to access 
They don't have barriers that prevent them from uh, initiating care um, because of financial barriers or geographic barriers. But sometimes more radical approaches are needed, which require the, the transformation of, of the, the way care is provided and the system that provides care. And some of these transformative approaches to quality improv- improvement can be such things as task shifting that allow skilled providers to be closer to the place where women give birth. <clears throat> it means digitization of the health uh, record, which allows uh, early warning signs to be, uh, for providers to be alerted to early warning signs that may contribute to infection and those kind of things. So the approach to improvement in quality and reducing maternal infection really has to be context specific and based on the goal that people are trying to to address. <clears throat> um, th- regardless of what the approach is, there should be a focus on improvement in data, tracking certain c- critical indicators to ensure that those critical indicators are able to, to be measured and monitored. Um, so, Quality improvement teams can help with that, uh, but really quality and data generation has to be the focus of the entire team. Um, the, the doing a num- there are a number of different indicators that are shown here that can be suggestive of uh, improved care. But making the data real and making the data available to people, this is an example of a data dashboard that we're using in a project in Tanzania. Uh, for the intervention is uh, a infection prevention bundle, which includes antibiotics, uh, vaginal wash with chlorhexidine, uh, and, and appropriate um, care, but tracking the administration of these bundles and the maternal sepsis rate n- must be available. That data must be available to all the staff. Once, the, once staff have a greater opportunity, to be able to uh, to implement and track data that are related to their intervention, I think they're they're much more energized, and every member of the of the team and every team in the facility really needs to be part of an effort to reduce infection. So, what are some of the things and programmatic approaches that can be done now in order to improve uh, care and improve infection rates? WHO has issued new guidelines, uh, and and those new guidelines can be used to help drive improvements in care. Prevention techniques such as uh, early uh, detection and treatment of antenatal infections are important, and better labor management. Uh, The previous speaker was asked a question about point-of-care diagnostics, and there has been some progress to improve those and improving uh, working with the pharmaceutical industry to improve treatment approaches so that broad spectrum antibiotics can be used to to reduce the burden on nurses of having to administer multiple different antibiotics in in different time periods. So with that, I'll wrap up. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, and and there, there is a lot of of energy in the maternal and early newborn infection reduction uh, arena. And many more hospitals and health systems are working on uh, strategies, both at the facility level and at the health system level, in order to prevent this major cause of both maternal and newborn infection. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, Jeffrey. It was a a fascinating overview of the of the situation. I'm really struck by your comment about the need for data and wonder if you have any comments on ways in which one can collect that data in settings where you have limited resources. Sure, that's a great question. Thank you, Andrew. The, um, the, the Many hospitals are already collecting that data, but they don't analyze it or they don't uh, discuss it and, and react to it. Um, there, there, are, uh, there are a number of hospitals that are already collecting data on post-operative infection rates um, or length, the, the number of women who uh, have a prolonged labor or prolonged stay in hospital due to infection. So it's, 
the the data collection is one step in the process, but I think data collection is stimulated when providers and, and leaders within facilities use that data. They review the data, they discuss the data, and that, I think, drives the, the curiosity and the need to collect better data. So I think it's a virtuous cycle. Thanks. And <clears throat> I mean, there is an opportunity for people to put in questions online that we could uh, address to Doc Smith. Um, again, just commenting on, on the data, you showed some methods of actually presenting that data. Would you like to comment on ways of helping people who perhaps don't have that much formal education in data management to actually recognize the trends and, and understand the implications of what the data is showing? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I, what I presented was a simple dashboard that can be a laminated sheet of paper that hangs in the in a common area where the the clinicians meet, um, and coming up with simple uh, indicators such as um, postpartum or post cesarean infection rate. Um, and then, if what's very, what's very important is that you link the outcome data such as post cesarean infection rate with the input data, such as the percentage of women who receive an infection prevention bundle of antibiotics and an appropriate skin prep, uh, et cetera. Uh, because those will show trends very quickly as the rate of, in of use of uh, preoperative antibiotics increases, the, the rate of post cesarean infection will fall. And that tends, those simple visual cues that, that staff can look at and discuss can be really stimulating uh, in terms of their, their readiness and willingness to continue the efforts. Okay, well, that's fantastic. I have one question that we can raise here where someone is asking, saying, perhaps using the Tanzania, Tanzania project as a case study, could you talk about the challenges and incentives for providers, local policymakers, and healthcare workers in implementing policy and clinical shifts? Yeah, that, that's a great question, and, and uh, it gets to the issue of motivation. Um, what, what motivates providers to provide better care and to reduce uh, infection rates? Uh, when we look at motivation for change, we have to think about, about both internal motivating factors and external motivating factors. Um, health, some health systems, uh, Nigeria is an example, where they're starting to pay for better outcomes. And so hospitals will be penalized if they don't reduce their infection rate. But other, uh, other health systems um, are supporting providers to provide better care. I think we all know that providers want to do a good job. They, they sometimes are frustrated in their ability to do a good job because of lack of resources. But simple approaches using available uh, antibiotics or available antiseptics for prevention of infection and showing them that they have the power to generate changed, improved care is often by itself a motivating factor. So tracking that data and showing it to them is really critical. Okay. Well, Jeffrey, thank you very much for that presentation and for all those answers. Um, we're going to move on now to the last presenter in this session, um, and that's Professor Kath Maitland, who's from Kenya. Um, Kat is a professor of pediatrics at Imperial College London, but is based full-time in East Africa. And she leads a research group with major portfolios in severe malaria, bacterial sepsis, and malnutrition in children. Um, her team conducted the FEAST study examining fluid resuscitation strategies in children with severe febrile illness. And that probably rocked the boat more than most studies <laughs> across the world. Um, so Kathy is now going to be speaking to us about fluid, fluid therapy in children in resource poor settings. Welcome, Kath. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, yes, that's exactly what I'm going to be talking about, fluid bolus therapy. In resource-limited settings, and um, just to remind you, that is where the uh, in hospitals where there is no access to intensive care. So I'll just start off with a very brief synopsis of the FEAST trial and um, why we conducted it and uh, uh, the um, 
what the key results were. Before we, we move on to the main topic, which I want to talk about, is really what um, since the FEAST trial, um, what has, um, has this resulted in any guideline change? Um, as uh, Andrew alluded, this was um, published in um, 2011. Um, um, in the New England Journal. So why did we ha conduct the trial in the first place? Well, at the time when we designed the trial and, and, um, and conducted the trial, most children um, in the, the settings where I, I, I work and, uh, and the feast was conducted, they weren't receiving fluid bolus therapies. In fact, doctors were quite anxious about giving fluid bolus. They, they were concerned about harm um, and, and in terms of fluid overload. Um, yet, in, in, the, in these settings, um, you, um, one will see about a 30% of children will access hospitals in their final illness, meaning that actually research and emergency care may be a really important way of um, um, reducing childhood mortality. 50% of the deaths in hospital will occur in the first 24 hours, once again suggesting what happens in the emergency room may be very critical. Um, we'd found that in um, a febrile illnesses, um, shock complicated 15% of the case fatalities. And, and prior to the conduct of FEAST, um, our data suggested that mortality in, in this group was between 15 and 20%. The simple question was, could a fluid bolus improve outcome? And the only way to test this was through a control trial. And jumping straight to the results, um, the, um, the trial was stopped early by the Data Monitoring Committee, um, and uh, it, it suggested there was a, an excess mortality of 3% in both the um, albumin and the saline arms compared to no bolus control. The most remarkable thing about the trial was the fact that there was large groups of children with sepsis, malaria, pneumonia, anemia, but in, in all of those subgroups, they, um, there was excess mortality, and we subsequently done a lot of sub-analysis, and we have not found a single group in whom fluid boluses were beneficial. So what was the cause of this mortality? We were definitely sure, saw that uh, fluid boluses reversed shock, but um, four or five hours later, we started to see an excess um, and events of children just dying with um, lethal cardiovascular collapse, and that was the chief cause of excess mortality. Um, not um, what we suspected was um, um, either neurological or respiratory events suggesting fluid overload. There's, there was quite a lot of questions about, well, the definitions of shock that we used, um, and we have looked at this. Um, and the FEAST trial takes a, took a very pragmatic um, uh, definition of shock, and, and and we were able to actually relook at sort of how did this apply to other definitions of shock, including the WHO definition. And we've, um, with every single um, definition of uh, shock, fluid boluses were in, um, associated with an increased mortality, especially in the group um, who had WHO shock. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so, has, has, uh, did this uh, result in a change in guidelines? The FEAST trial was uh, published in 2011, and we sent uh, the WHO uh, and also the guideline group uh, a policy brief. Um, yet, in 2013, the guidelines continue to recommend fluid boluses. We then looked at the, the, the continuing um, recommendations of fluid boluses um, um, and the fact that, uh, that they, they didn't um, that, um, the feast trial wasn't incorporated in this. And we published in the BMJ in 2014 um, our, our, our predictions for the excess mortality um, associated with fluid bolus therapy per million doses, and that could be up to up to in, um, in Africa alone, 33,000 excess deaths, while WHO continued to recommend fluid boluses. Some of the, uh, some of the members of the guideline group um, um, had, uh, had all already published in BMJ Open their uh, um, review of the actual uh, uh, the fluid um, management guidelines. Um, unfortunately, they took the children who had WHO shock, and this was a very, very small group. They looked at that group separately and suggested that the trial was too small to be able to make any strong recommendations and downgraded that to a low quality of evidence, um, suggesting that the size was too small and therefore that the evidence was indirect. Um, 
obviously for children who did have uh, who didn't have WHO shock, but any other signs of shock, they obviously have said that this was high quality of evidence, and these children should not receive fluid bolus therapy. But they did suggest that for those who had WHO shock, they should continue to receive bolus therapy. Earlier this year, we did. Um, we look at all of the and the, the, these recommendations in a, in a publication in Critical Care, a first author, um, Houston, Kirsty Houston. Um, once again, re-looking at the paediatric definitions of shock and also the recommendations in the light of the FEAST trial. But also, how relevant are the WHO shock guidelines, uh, shock definitions uh, to paediatric cohorts? They've certainly not been validated. I think one of the, f the first things to say is that um, although we actually had a subgroup in, in the CEASE trial who had um, severe hypotension, that was a very, very small subgroup. Um, it's, and, and it wasn't because we were able to recruit them. It was because we had a deferred content process and we had screened thousands of children. It was, in fact, that, that actually um, um, hypotension, severe hypotension is actually relatively rare in um, pediatric shock. We once again were able to show for all of the definitions of shock, um, mortality was um, uh, was uh, uh, worse in, in the, those receiving boluses. We also discussed um, in quite a lot of uh, detail about the use of indirectness in terms of uh, grading of evidence. This can only be used uh, if you know, it's a biologically different subgroup, which is it's, it's, it clearly quite isn't. But also, um, the, it, it, the indirectness can't be inferred from a, a, a the small size of, alone, especially if the actual direction of effect is in the same direction as the overall result. What we can be very sure about is even the children who do have WHO shock will have a 3% excess mortality if they continue to receive WHO, uh, if they continue to receive fluid boluses. We also then, as I said, we went to look to see how, from the published uh, literature on, on shock, which is, is not a huge amount, how relevant is the WHO criteria? And if you go right down to the bottom of the the table, we we um, were able to assemble uh, nearly 99,000 uh, uh, information on that, and we only found WHO shock in 170 patients. So it's suggesting it's very, very rare um, in uh, normal pediatric cohorts. Although the mortality in the FEAST trial was 42%, in these cohorts it was 85% and in some 100%. So it, it's, it's selecting a very, very small group that's, that's relatively um, irrelevant for the most pediatric um, emissions with an exceptionally high mortality. So what other data have been produced um, that, that looks to go in the same direction as what um, as ceased? Um, so there's a, a, a trial that was a re, a recently published in JAMA. It was in adults um, comparing an early protocol of management in Zambian, um, um, uh, septic Zambian adults and compared to the, their usual standard of care. They found that uh, they had a very good separation between the fluid uh, protocolized uh, and the uh, controls in terms of volumes of fluid received, 3.5 liters in the first six hours, compared to two liters in the control. They also they also found a higher mortality, 48% in the protocolized group compared to the control. But also um, the protocol group had a much, much higher uh, requirement for vasopressors. Our group has, uh, has continued on some of the work, but we've done Feast in Sheep. Um, this was uh, published by uh, 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 John Fraser's group in um, Brisbane. Um, it, this was recently pu published in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care. They, um, they gave fluid boluses to uh, a, a sheep after um, inducing shock with uh, endotoxin, and they showed that, uh, that noradrenaline and vasopressor requirements to keep the blood pressure up in the sheep was substantially higher in the saline arm compared to the control. The saline arm is the red graph. But they also showed evidence um, in the first uh, 12 hours of um, increased hyaluronidin. It's a, a, a marker of um, uh, um, uh, endothelial damage, but also a, a much higher troponin level um, in those who, who received uh, uh, saline boluses. I could keep on talking all day, but we've got to wind this up now. But I think 
I, I, will, I have said since Beast first do no harm. While WHO continue to recommend bolus for a very, very small population at risk, we, we are con- I am concerned about that this risks confusion and there might be slippage at the bedside um, because clinicians don't remember that you've got to have all four features of shock to um, f- um, in WHO, a weak and rapid pulse with, uh, with a capillary refill of greater than uh, three seconds and cold peripheries. And we're concerned that there's a potential to do harm to a wider group of children. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kath, for a very clear presentation on and some very impressive data. Perhaps while we waiting for some questions from the audience, can I just ask you to, you've spoken very clearly about the issues of boluses. What Can you just highlight the background fluid therapy that the patients who were not receiving boluses were getting? Because I think that's also relevant to the audience. Yes, so um, we were very, uh, we, well, when we, the, the results were out, we were very clear that the, the children in the control arm were getting fluid, but they were only getting maintenance therapy at about four mils per kilo per hour. We didn't want to say take take drips out of children. Yes, they do need to be hydrated, but only uh, enough um, to, uh, fluid to, to, cor- to rec- correct what they would normally mm-hmm. take orally. So, so, in fact, the the children were, those who weren't getting boluses, as well as those who got boluses, were actually getting about 100 mils per kilo per day of maintenance fluids. Is that uh, yeah. correct? That's correct. Um, I've just got, I've got one question here from one of the audience saying, um, <laughs> I guess it's quite close to your heart, asking how you will disseminate the particular information to health providers in the world. I know you've tried very hard to do that, but perhaps you have some further ideas on that. Uh, of dissemination, well, we have um, we have a policy brief. We have um, we've sent this to uh, a number of uh, um, obviously um, people who do uh, make um, and guidelines and policy. Um, it's interesting that um, within six months of the publication of Feast, the MSF group, sorry, Medicine Sans Frontieres group, had brought their their pediatric guideline people together, and, and this is across all of the uh, the, the different uh, um, MSF organisations. And they reviewed the data, and and they had also con- um, conducted their, their own systematic review and decided to change their guidelines. So um, I think our some of our outreach has helped. Okay, and I mean related to that, and I think you've partially answered is a, is another question saying, can you suggest any guidelines or protocols that are used locally in sub-Saharan Africa? Um, well, most people use WHO guidelines. Um, uh, country protocols tend to adopt what WHO recommends. Um, it's uh, it's it's such, yeah, um, and I think uh, for people to sort of have their own guidelines means that they have to bring t- people together and, and review. I mean, I don't know. Um, I, I'm going to ask you, Andrew, uh, um, um, what would happen in South Africa. Look, I think part of the, there's been, uh, you know, your data has clearly <laughs> provided a lot of food for thought in, for people in, in South Africa. I think increasingly people are following the guidelines that you're recommending. Um, but as, as you know, there's still some people who feel that this is, um, fairly controversial. Um, just to carry on picking up on the, questions. One of the questions is, do you think that there's a different physiology for septic children in this geography compared to other climates? And and I guess that addresses some of the issues about dissemination across the world. I know. I mean, it it was a result that we've struggled to accept to start with. And um, and I think a lot of there's been a lot of discussion whether it's malaria or anemia, but certainly when we we did see children with sepsis um, and back, you know bacterial proven sepsis, and they actually did worse than the groups um, with malaria. And so I think um, it's it, it's you know 
testing interventions is really, really challenging. And, and, and when we talked to the nurses and doctors, they all said they saw children getting better on boluses. Um, but actually, when the numbers added up at the end, it was, it was the reverse was true. I think, yes, it does reverse shock, but it didn't um, save lives. Um, and we proposed that actually um, shock is probably a protective mechanism. And if you rapidly reverse that, um, you might do harm. And, I mean, that makes sense. And, Catherine, just to highlight again, you excluded children from diarrhea from the study. And do you think that the study has any, any implications for rehydration for children who are dehydrated? Um, I think so. I mean, I think it's quite aggressive, um, bec uh, giving up to um, 100 mils in, in, in three hours. I mean, it's th three to five hours. That's quite aggressive. And, and most of this is obviously it's uh, extravascular fluid that you're replacing because they're dehydrated. And the vast majority of the diarrhea that we see is not um, secretory diarrhea, i.e. cholera. Um, and one might be concerned that, um, you know, what, uh, that what, you know, should we be doing uh, rehydration a little slower? It, it will need its own time. And I thank you very much for um, 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 pointing that out, that actually gastroenteritis wasn't included in the trial. Thank you. And the, the other piece that I, I guess is always controversial is where do you think malnutrition fits into this whole game and, and food issues? Yes, uh, they they were also excluded from the trial. Although um, the the data around sort of whether they do actually have uh, myocard um, incipient myocardial impairment is also relatively controversial. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation and and all, all the responses to those those questions and to all our audience. Um, thank you for attending. That brings us to the end of this particular session. A huge thank you to all our speakers who I think have given us fascinating insights into sepsis issues uh, across the world. Um, I would encourage people to log on. Um, to look at the social media and to support us in that way. For those who are interested, the program is continuing. And in fact, the session 14, which is really um, survivors speaking about their experience and also people who've lost family members to sepsis will be speaking about their experience. And you could join that and, and continue with that process. Um, I hope that you've enjoyed what we've presented, um, and I really need to thank, thank our sponsors who have supported this World Sepsis Day and, and have made it possible for all of us across the world to hear these presentations, to join in the discussion, and learn a little bit more about sepsis. So thank you very much, and that brings the session to an end. <laughs>